Hello, Kotlin 1.9 is here. In this video, I will talk about the language and standard library updates, but also about the important changes in Kotlin native and Kotlin multi-platform projects. This release is focused on making things stable and the team is polishing various features for the target platforms as the priority is to provide a truly consistent multi-platform experience. The work on K2 compiler continues and the new release introduces basic support for Kotlin native and adds some fixes for Kotlin JS. This means that K2 is now available for multi-platform projects. There is now a new property to enable K2 in the multi-platform setting. You can either add the property to the Gradle properties file or add it from the command line as an argument. The Gradle property automatically sets the language version to 2.0 and updates the build report with the number of Kotlin tasks compiled using K2. K2 is the most important project for Kotlin evolution after it will be released in 2.0, so please give it a try and share your feedback. You can join the K2 Early Adopters channel in Kotlin Slack, report your findings to Utrack, and allow sharing the usage statistics in the IDE. This will help us to better understand the situation with K2 adoption. In the past releases, we have been constantly adding new features. As you can see, the experimental features were added in the .20 minor releases. We have processed the feedback and ensured that those new language features can now be made stable. I have covered all of the features in my previous release videos, but let's recap what it is all about. So the new entries property in the enum classes is here to replace the values function. There is a difference in the return type for the entries property and values function though. The values function returns an array, and a call to the entries property returns a pre-allocated immutable list of defined constants instead. This change fixes the potential performance issues and it's much more convenient to work with the list if you need to process the enum constants in your program. Data objects have been in works for a while now and finally this feature is stable as well. As you may remember, data objects allow you to declare objects with a singleton semantics and clean two-string representation. So instead of printing an object reference, the toString function returns a simple name of the type. The equals function ensures that all objects that have the type of your data object are considered equal. So even if one data object is created in a program and I create another instance of the same data object using reflection, the equals function ensures that the two instances are equal. However, Make sure that you compare data objects using the equals operator and never by reference. By the way, it's all documented, so be sure to check the updated documentation about all the new features. And if you would like to get a detailed overview of what you can do with data classes, Sebastian has made an awesome video about this feature. Check the description for the links. The secondary constructors for inline classes is now a stable language feature. The inline classes only accept one parameter in the primary constructor. With the secondary constructors, it is now possible to use multiple parameters and it is fine since at the end you will call the primary constructor with a single parameter anyway. For example, you can combine multiple parameters into one for the primary constructor. But what is more important is that you can validate the parameters one by one. And finally, the range until operator has been made stable. Previously, to create an open-ended range, you could use the until function. However, it wasn't clear if this range includes or excludes the value on the right. The new operator claims to improve the readability of such code and this feature has proven useful and well received, so now it's time to make it stable. While we were working on this feature, the IDE team also added hints to indicate the inclusiveness of the range. Hope you will find it useful. And guess what, Sebastian also made a good video about this language feature, so check that out as well if you haven't seen it yet. Now, let's see what happened to the standard library. In the standard library, 
the stabilization story continues, parts of the time API are promoted to stable. We added a path extension function to create parent directories and it's marked as stable from the start. We finally stabilized regular expression group capturing by name and the volatile annotation is now marked as stable and we couldn't resist adding a new experimental class hex format to format hexadecimals. Let's take a look at the examples of those APIs. First, the time API is getting stable. The comparable and subtractable time marks were introduced to precisely pin moments of time in program execution. This is especially useful when you need to compare the results. In this example, we created two time marks in the beginning of the code snippet and then continuously calculate the elapsed time difference in the loop. The important part here is that the difference between the elapsed time intervals is going to remain constant throughout the execution of the program. And since time marks are now comparable, you can validate if one time mark was captured later than the other. The other two functions that are related to time marks are the has passed now and has not passed now. These are useful for checking if the desired time interval has passed or not. Two more functions for measuring time have been made stable. We have previously published a dedicated video about these functions. And again, the link is in the description. As you can see, the main difference is that the measured time returns the duration of the block execution, while measured timed value returns an instance of timed value that contains the duration as well as the result of the block execution. In this release, we added a new extension function, create parent directories, that you can use to create a new file along with the required path. When you provide a file to this function, it checks if the parent directories already exist. If they don't exist, the function will create the missing directories for you. This function might come in handy in combination with the copy to recursively function that is still marked as experimental. So this function creates the parent directories for the provided path and behaves the same way if the path points to a file or a folder. Before 1.9, Every platform had its own extension to get a regular expression capture group by its name from a regular expression match. It wasn't possible to have a common function because the standard library had to support JVM targets 1.6 and 1.7. Starting with Kotlin 1.8, the standard library is compiled with JVM target 1.8. So in this release, there is now a common function called groups that is actually a property that retrieves the group's contents by its name for a regular expression match. Here is an example with a regular expression containing three capture groups, the city, state, and area code. Then you can use these group names to access the matched values. And check this out, the ID will help to work with regular expressions too. If you press Alt-Enter and select to check the regular expression, in the pop-up, you will be able to validate how the regular expression matches the provided input. And the capture groups are highlighted there as well. This release wouldn't be complete without new experimental feature, wouldn't it? In 1.9, the hex format class and its related extension functions are provided as experimental feature that allows you to convert between numerical values and hexadecimal strings. Here is an example of converting the integer value to a hexadecimal string in uppercase format. And you can configure other formatting options with hex format builder. If you want to format a number, then there is a number configuration block in the builder. To format a byte array, you can use the bytes block. For instance, here I have configured a number of bytes to be printed per line, a separator, and a prefix for each byte. Then I can apply this format when converting a byte array to a hexadecimal string. And here's the result. I've got three lines of bytes, four bytes in each line, all bytes prefixed with 0x and separated by a colon character. The hex format class provides a list of extension functions to work the process backwards. That is, start with a hexadecimal string and by configuring the format, 
it is possible to convert the string back to a primitive type. For instance, here I have the first six bytes from the previous example. I have configured a format and by using the hex to byte array function, I can parse the initial hexadecimal string. By the way, you can discover the list of other extension functions simply with the completion action in the ID. So once I have the bytes, it's easy to try converting these bytes to characters. In this case, the result is Kotlin being printed in the standard output. So it looks like an interesting simple utility. As this feature is experimental, of course, you will need to opt in to try it. So give it a go and let us know how it works for you. If you annotate a var property with volatile annotation, then the backing field is marked so that any reads or writes to this field are atomic and writes are always made visible to the other threads. Prior to 1.820, the volatile annotation was only effective on the JVM target. If you used it in other platforms, it was simply ignored. In 1.820, we introduced an experimental common annotation in Kotlin concurrent package that you could preview in both the JVM and Kotlin native. In 1.9, Kotlin concurrent volatile annotation is stable. This closes another shortcoming for Kotlin multi-platform. Kotlin native is a big topic this time as it is an important part of Kotlin multi-platform strategy. The team was working on a new memory manager for a while and now it looks like they start introducing optimizations and polishing the corner cases. Until now, Kotlin native was using mimalloc general purpose allocator with an option to fall back to the system memory allocator when needed. Mimalloc is a very major and performant allocator, but it seems that Kotlin has its own object allocation patterns. Specifically, Kotlin programs allocate a lot of very small objects whose lifespan is very short. For this reason, the team introduced a preview of a new allocator that is tuned to handle the allocation patterns that are specific to Kotlin. To enable this new allocator, you need to add the compiler configuration option. To provide your feedback, please comment on the issue KT55364 in Utrack. Starting with this release, Objective-C or Swift object deallocation hook is now called on the main thread if the object is passed to Kotlin on the main thread. Consider an Objective-C object that is referenced in the Kotlin code. For example, we could pass the object as an argument to a Kotlin function from Objective-C code, or if we call Objective-C function from Kotlin and return the object as a result. In this case, Kotlin creates its own object that holds a reference to the Objective-C object. When Kotlin object gets deallocated, the Kotlin native runtime calls opc release function that releases the Objective-C reference. The problem could come up when Objective-C objects have custom deallocation hooks and these hooks expect to be called uh, on a specific thread, especially when the object was allocated on the main thread. Starting with 1.9, the deallocation hook is called on the main thread as well. It should cover the cases when the Objective-C object was passed to Kotlin on the main thread, creating a Kotlin peer object on the main thread. This only works if the main dispatch queue is processed, which is the case with regular UI applications. When the Objective-C object was passed to Kotlin on a thread other than the main thread, the deallocation hook is called on a special GC thread as before. Another big change in Kotlin native is related to library linkage during compilation. Now the behavior is similar to what we have in the JVM world. The build process would not fail during compilation in case of linkage issues between the third-party Kotlin libraries. Let me quickly explain the subject to you. Assume we are building the application and there are two third-party dependencies, library A and library B. At the same time, library B was compiled against the previous version of library A. The two versions of library A are incompatible as a few functions have been removed in the newer version. Before Kotlin 1.9, 
this situation would lead to a compilation error even if the removed function in library A would never be called during the lifetime of our application. This is a very strict behavior and promotes safety, but it seems to make developers' life much harder when working with the third-party libraries. Starting with this release, Kotlin native compiler would replace the call sites to the missing symbols with a throw instruction and add a user-friendly error message that will be printed at runtime. So the behavior is now very similar to what we have in the JVM world. The Kotlin native compiler reports warning every time it detects issues with library linkage. You can configure or even disable the behavior by providing the compiler options in the Gradle build script of your project. I invite you to watch another good video on this subject by Dmitry Dolovov, delivered at KotlinConf this year. Please find the link in the description below. The last update I want to cover about Kotlin Native in this video is an optimization that avoids initializing the object when accessing constval fields. Now the behavior is unified with the JVM target where the implementation is consistent with Java and objects are never initialized in this case. You can also expect some performance improvements in your Kotlin native projects thanks to this change. There are many more small changes that you can read about in the What's New section in Kotlin documentation for this release. This includes updates in the Gradle plugin, deprecation of various APIs, and other minor improvements. Everything with the goal of making Kotlin multi-platform experience as smooth as possible. Since the team is working hard on stabilizing multi-platform projects, some of the changes require special attention and the team asked me to include important information about the changes for Android target support. The important change is that in the future, the Android team from Google will provide its own Gradle plugin to support Android in Kotlin multi-platform projects. For this, we need to rename the Android block to Android target block in the current Kotlin DSL. This is a temporary change that is necessary to free the Android name for the upcoming DSL from Google. Once the new plugin from Google team is shipped, it will become the preferred way of working with Android in multi-platform projects. Hand in hand with the previous change, starting from this release, the new Android source set layout introduced in Kotlin 1.8.0 is now the default. And the main change here is that the new layout comes with a new naming schema for the directories. With this change, the source directories arrangement becomes more coherent, making it easier to organize code and locate source files. The new layout requires Android Gradle plugins 7.0 or later, and it is supported in Android Studio 2022.3 or later. We will link the migration guide for you to make the necessary changes in your Gradle build file. Okay, it looks like the video is getting pretty long and I better stop here. Thanks much if you watched this far. Be sure to try the new Kotlin version and send us your feedback. Until next time and have a nice Kotlin.